read our scripture passage for us today. The scripture for today's sermon comes from 1 Samuel 18, 5 through 9. The word of God speaks to us like this. David marched out with the army and was successful in everything Saul sent him to do. Saul put him in command of the fighting men, which pleased all the people and Saul, Saul's servants as well. As the troops were coming back, when David was returning from killing the Philistine, the women came out from all over the cities of Israel to meet King Saul, singing and dancing with tambourines, with shouts of joy, and with three-stringed instruments. As they danced, the women sang, Saul has killed his thousands, but David his tens of thousands. Saul was furious and resented the song. They credited tens of thousands to David, he complained, but they only credited me with thousands. What more can he have but the kingdom? So Saul watched David jealous, jealously from that day forward. This is the very word of God to us. Thanks be to God. I'll turn my mic on and uh, let's pray and ask for God's help together. Um, God, we thank you that you've given us your word and we thank you, God, that you've sent your spirit to open our eyes to see, open our ears to hear, open our hearts to receive your word. And so I pray that you would, even now in this moment, give us the impression that we need you to do what we're about to do. Um, we, need you, we need your help to see you in your word. We need your help to hear from you in your word. We need your help, Spirit of God, to be changed by this word. Ultimately, what we need is to be satisfied by the good news of Jesus through this word. So help us. We say we can't do it without you, but our eyes are on you, God. So would you do that? It's in your name, Christ, we pray. Amen. Um, one of the reasons that song, It Is Well, is such a gift to me, and um, one of the reasons that I'm just not able to sing it without breaking down in some way is um, <clears throat> it's a song that we... Um, we really cling to in 2019 when our lives utterly fell apart. Um, some of you guys know some of our story. Um, in 2019, uh, we walked through pretty significant betrayal. Um, we had to, uh, we, were, we were forced out of the church that we had given our lives to. We, um, we had to leave the home that my daughter was born in and the home that we really thought, like, we're going to stay here until... Kristen and I are too old to be able to go upstairs, and then we'll get a, we'll get a one-story home. We, um, yeah, we just had to say goodbye and watch the death of a lot of dreams that we had dreamed. And um, by far the most painful thing during that time was uh, the three closest friends I had in my life during that time um, really turned their back on me. And to this day... Uh, I don't know why. Um, to this day, I've tried to have conversations. I've tried to find it out. I've tried to control things with my own strength. And the dominating question during that time in my heart was like, why have you treated me? What have I done? <laughs> like, what have I done to make you treat me so cruelly? Um, and those represent the hardest moments in our lives, right? Like, you can survive financial ruin and losing your job, and how am I going to make it? But those moments where you have friends who are with you in the pits of life, who you turn around and realize, like, they've gotten out of the foxhole, and I don't know why. Um, they're really difficult. Maybe you're in here, and you're a teenager, or you're a young kid, and you would say, man, yeah, already in my life. Like, I have friends who aren't my friends anymore, and, and frankly, I don't really know why. I don't know what I did to make them treat me that way. Um, we're going to get into this passage in 1 Samuel where David is going to walk through something very similar. He's going to experience significant betrayal by those he loves, and he's going to ask the question, what have I done? What have I done? And that's a legitimate question to say, like, hey, if I've done something that I'm not aware of, please tell me. That's part of what friendship is. And so David's going to ask that. Now, let me catch you up to where we are in 1 Samuel. So we saw a couple weeks ago... David comes up and he defeats the giant Goliath. 
Goliath was um, the warrior of the Philistine army. Philistines were the enemies of the people of God, and they were really afraid of him, and even King Saul wasn't going out to fight this battle. David shows up, and he says, God's actually going to fight this battle. I trust him. David goes out. He kills Goliath, and then he just ends up like going to war for God against God's enemies, and the people love him. And what you just heard read from Marissa is, Saul experiences the way that people see David, and he gets really jealous and angry, and he thinks like, hey, people think more of David than of me. What gives? This isn't turning out how I want to. And as we journey through the text today, I want you to see the author is going to juxtapose two things, and one is Saul's anger. He's going to let you see the anger of Saul towards David and all that he does to try to kill David, but he's also going to highlight God's favor towards David. And one of those things is going to win, and it's not going to be Saul's anger to give it away. And in the midst of all of this, David's going to end with this question, what have I I done? What have I done? So 1 Samuel 18, beginning in verse 10, just after the passages Marissa read, it says, the next day an evil spirit sent from God came powerfully on Saul, who's king during this time, and he began to rave inside the palace. David was playing the lyre. It's a musical instrument, as usual. But Saul was holding a spear, and he threw it, thinking, I'll pin David to the wall. But David got away from him twice. And Saul was afraid of David because the Lord was with David, but had left Saul. Therefore, Saul sent David away from him and made him commander over a thousand men. David led the troops and continued to be successful in all his activities because the Lord was with him. So here you have Saul's anger. I'm going to throw a spear, try to kill David. David gets away, and Saul's like, okay, go, go out to battle. Maybe the Philistines will kill you, so I don't have to. But God is with David. And then in verses 17 through 19, Saul promises David uh, one of his daughters to marry, which he had promised when he defeated Goliath. Whoever kills Goliath gets to become my son-in-law, marry one of my daughters. And instead, um, Saul's like, yeah, I'm not going to do that. And he gives this woman to another man. And then in verse 20, look what happens. It says, now Saul's daughter, Michal, loved David. So he has another daughter who loves David. And when it was reported to Saul, it pleased him. Not because he's a fan of David now, but because he says, I'll give her to him, Saul thought. She'll be a trap for him, and the hand of the Philistines will be against him. So Saul said to David a second time, you can now be my son-in-law. So Saul concocts this plan where he's like, you know what, I'm not very good at throwing spears. I've missed David twice. So maybe I'll tell him, hey, you can marry my daughter now if you go fight the Philistines. And he's like, the Philistines are going to kill him. It's all going to work out great. Here's Saul's plan for how David is going to be killed by the Philistines. Saul replied, say this to David. This is verse 25. The king desires no other bride price except 100 Philistine foreskins to take revenge on his enemies. Actually, Saul intended to cause David's death at the hand of the Philistines. Let me explain two things that need explaining. A bride price during this time was something that a a potential groom would offer to a family, uh, to a father and to a family of a woman he was going to marry, to honor and to bless that family. And Saul is like, hey, I'm king. I don't don't need money. I got plenty of sheep. I got plenty of oxen. I want you to go get me 100 Philistine foreskins. And if, if you are uh, in here and you're young and don't know what foreskins are, talk with your parents so they don't get mad at me. And if you're old and don't know what a foreskin is, you can talk with Blake. He would love to talk with you <laughs> after the gathering. So look how David responds. I just got to imagine if I was David, I'd be like, a uh, hundred jars of wine? Is that what you said? Or like a hundred swords of a Philistine? Like, no, okay, you sound... Maybe sword and foreskin sounds the same in the Hebrew, but nope, it's foreskin. That's the last time I'm going to say that word today. Okay, verse 26. (laughs) When the servants reported these terms to David, he was pleased to become the king's son-in-law. He's like, okay, Saul, good plan. Before the wedding day arrived, David and his men went out and killed 200 Philistines. Oh, I lied. I forgot about it. He brought their foreskins last time, presented them as a full payment to the king to become his son-in-law. Then Saul gave his daughter Michal to David as his wife. Verse 28, Saul realized that the Lord was with David and that his daughter Michal loved him, and he became even more afraid of David. As a result, Saul was David's enemy from that day forward. Every time the Philistine commanders came out to fight, David was more successful than all of Saul's officers, so he became well-known. Like... (laughs) 
I got to imagine, well known, not just amongst the Israelites, but against the Philistines also. I guarantee you the Philistines, every time they saw David coming into battle, ran away with their tail between their legs for sure. Uh, Saul's anger and his jealousy rage against David, but what the author shows us is that just as much as Saul's anger rages against David, God's favor pursues and protects David. Then in chapter 19, you would think Saul would be like, okay, I'm going to give up now. Clearly God's hand is with David. I'm not going to continue to do this. Well, he says, that plan didn't work. I can't throw spears. Let me tell my son Jonathan to go kill David. And Jonathan's like, nope, not going to do that. So David tries again. Maybe he's been practicing his spear throwing. He tries again to pin David to a wall with a spear. He misses again. And then David runs away, understandably, and he runs away to where Samuel is training new prophets. And he goes there. Saul hears about it. He sends an assassin to go to where uh, David is with Samuel. He sends a group of assassins, the same one, side note, he had sent just earlier to his daughter and his son-in-law's house to kill him, and his daughter protects David. And so he sends this group of assassins, says, hey, go kill David, he's with Samuel. They go there, the spirit of the Lord comes upon them, they begin to prophesy with all the prophets. And they come back, and they're like, did you kill David? And they're like, no, we prophesied with him. He's like, son of a gun. So he sends another group of people. Same thing happens. Sends a third group of people again. Same thing happens. Then what does Saul do? Because he's a knucklehead like me. He's hard-headed. Takes a lot of pain to get hold of him. So he's like, you want anything done right? You got to do it yourself. So Saul goes, and the text tells us before Saul even gets there, on the way, the Spirit of the Lord comes on him. He rolls into that camp prophesying. He ends chapter 19 literally naked before the Lord on his face prophesying. And I got to imagine at some point he comes to and is like, that did not go how, how I planned. Where are, where, are my, where are my clothes? Like all of this, and you got to just imagine David, like God has made promises to him. God has anointed him. He defeats Goliath. He is a terror to the Philistines, understandably. He marries Saul's daughter and maybe thinks like now I'm his son-in-law. He'll love me finally. He doesn't. All the while, Saul rages against him and David doesn't know why. And by the way, if you're wondering like, David, what's wrong with you? Why do you keep going back to Saul? He loves Saul and he recognizes Saul as the king of Israel during this time. So he loves God, he loves Saul, and all throughout all of this, God is with David. God pursues David. In God is in, in, in this moment, like he's, he's overthrowing Saul, he's exalting David, and he's providing for and protecting not just David, but the nation of Israel as well. And one of the ways that God provides through for David is through an unlikely friendship, a pretty surprising friendship. In the midst of all Saul's anger and David's confusion about what's going on is this profound friendship with Jonathan. And Jonathan is, by the way, Saul's son, meaning he would have been next in line to become king. And what the author does is he bookends 1 Samuel 18 and 1 Samuel 20 with this unique friendship between David and Jonathan. It's a friendship that's bound by covenant. So let me show you the first bookend, 1 Samuel 18. This is before any of the events that we've talked about. It says, when David had finished speaking with Saul, Jonathan was bound to David in close friendship. The ESV translate that, the soul of Jonathan was knit to the soul of David. And David loved Jonathan as much as he loved himself. Verse 3, Jonathan made a covenant with David because he loved him as much as himself. Then Jonathan removed the robe he was wearing and gave it to David, along with his military tunic, his sword, his bow, and his belt. Let me explain what's going on with the covenant and the robe, because sometimes those feel like details, like, why is he talking about the robe that he gave away? Did David not have one? During this time, when you would make a covenant, what would happen is they would take an animal, and they would cut the animal in two and lay it on either side of this path, And then both parties to that covenant would walk between the animal. And that was the way that they sealed a covenant. And what they were saying in doing that was, God do so to me. God literally tear me in half if I'm not faithful to this covenant that I'm making. So they make that covenant together. Jonathan says, if I'm not faithful, God tear me in half. David says the same. And then Jonathan gives David his robe, his military tunic, his sword, his bow, and his belt. 
Now, no detail in the Bible is insignificant. What Jonathan is doing here is recognizing David as the next king. So Jonathan says, this robe that signifies my position and my personhood as the next king of Israel, I'm recognizing God giving you that robe, and I'm giving you my sword, and I'm giving you my bow. So he affirms the person and position of David, and he makes a covenant with, he makes a covenant with David. And then here's the other bookend. So that starts this passage, chapter 20, verses 1 through 4. So again, Saul is trying to kill David. David fled from Nioth and Ramah and came to Jonathan. And he asked Jonathan, what have I done? What did I do wrong? How have I sinned against your father so that he wants to take my life? Jonathan said to him, no, you won't die. Listen, my father doesn't do anything, great or small, without telling me. So why would he hide this matter from me? This can't be true. But David responds to Jonathan. He says, your father certainly knows that I've found favor with you. He said, Jonathan must not know this or else he will be grieved. He's like, hey, Saul knows that you and I are bound by covenant and he's not telling you so that you won't try to thwart it or you won't be bummed out by the plan. Um, David also swore, as surely as the Lord lives and as you yourself lives, there's but a step between me and death. Jonathan said to David, whatever you say, I'll do for you. So David gives him this request. He tells Jonathan, hey, tomorrow when you go to the king's court to eat where David would normally be there, he says, I'm not going to go and tell Saul if he asks that I had to go to Bethlehem to offer a sacrifice. And if Saul is like, okay, that's fine, that means he doesn't plan to kill me. But if Saul gets angry with you, that means he does plan to kill me. And Jonathan says, okay, I'm going to do exactly that. Verse 12. It says, by the Lord, the God of Israel, I will sound out my father by this time tomorrow or the next day. If I find out that he is favorable toward you, will I not send for you and tell you? If my father intends to bring evil on you, may the Lord punish Jonathan and do so severely if I do not tell you and send you away so you may leave safely. May the Lord be with you just as he was, past tense, with my father. If I continue to live, show me kindness from the Lord. But if I die, don't ever withdraw your kindness from my household. Not even when the Lord cuts off every one of David's enemies from the face of the earth. Verse 16, he reaffirms this covenant. Then Jonathan made a covenant with the house of David saying, may the Lord hold David's enemies accountable. At this time, his father was one of his enemies. Jonathan once again swore to David in his love for him because he loved him as he loved himself. So Jonathan comes back to the court. He does that plan. This is how Saul responds in verse 30. Saul became angry with Jonathan and shouted, you son of a perverse and rebellious woman, which is a really, um, man, people have called me son of a words before. This is, this is like, this got some heat on it. Because by the by, Jonathan, this woman who Jonathan is the son of, is Saul's wife. Like, I got to imagine that she's somewhere within earshot. And he's like, you son of a perverse woman. She's like, whoa, dude, that escalated quickly. What do you mean? Side note, man, you ever say that to me? Don't you speak on my mama like that? I'll pop you one. Okay, you son of a perverse and rebellious woman. These are just things that stand out to me in the text. It doesn't really have anything to do with today. Don't I know that you are siding with Jesse's son to your own shame and to the disgrace of your mother? Every day Jesse's son lives on earth. You and your kingship are not secure. Now send for him, bring him to me, he must die. Saul says, Jonathan, don't you want to be king? If David stays alive, it's a threat to my kingdom and to your future kingdom. We need to kill him. And Jonathan tells David this plan and... um, David and Jonathan meet one last time. There's one more time in the life of David and Jonathan where they'll meet. It's a very quick meeting. So this is the second to the last time they'll see each other. And this is how this moment ends in verse 42. David is about to run away. Jonathan said to David, go in the assurance the two of us pledged in the name of the Lord when we said the Lord will be a witness between you and me and between my offspring and your offspring forever. Then David left and Jonathan went into the city. 
So he again doubles down on and affirms this covenant that he's made with David. He says, David, I am with you. Be assured of that, though I'm not going to be with you in proximity. I am with you in soul and spirit. I'm not backing down from the covenant we've made. And this is a passage where I think it's easy to make this about like a sentimental relationship. Oh, David and Jonathan, they're such good friends. The verse before this, they're weeping together. And guys, you just need to find somebody that you can weep with. Isn't this just an adorable relationship? Well, it's actually way deeper than that. It's way deeper, and, and frankly, we would do disservice to the message of the text to make the application of it. Just go find your Jonathan, or be a Jonathan to somebody else. They, 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 like Jonathan's loyalty to David was unconditional. No matter what it cost Jonathan, he was going to be loyal to David even though it cost him dearly. I, I mean, don't, I know none of us are kings or in, are in line to be a king, but it's a pretty big deal, okay? Like, most important job around during this time. And Jonathan making this covenant with David was Jonathan saying, I am laying down my rights to be king to make this covenant with you. It cost him significantly. It cost him his relationship with his father. It cost him his relationship with his mother, likely. Saul points out, you're a disgrace to your mom, Shame on you. Who are you? It costs him the kingship. Um, it almost costs him his life. David gets ticked off, or Saul gets ticked off at Jonathan. David's nowhere to be found. So Saul's like, I'm going to see if I can hit you with a spear. He tries to kill his own son. And later in our series, you'll see that it, it costs Jonathan his life. This commitment to David. It's not just a sentimental friendship. It's deep, unconditional love for one another. Jonathan's love and friendship for David was marked by self-sacrifice. He gave up what was his for the sake of David. And don't miss the fact that for David, he is saved through Jonathan's love for him. David would have died had Jonathan not intervened in this moment. And so David's salvation comes through Jonathan's sacrifice. So we can't merely walk away from this text saying, be a Jonathan to your friends and find you a Jonathan. Because what ends up happening if you do that is you end up perpetually disappointed in your friends because nobody can be a friend quite like Jonathan. And you end up, if you're honest, ashamed of who you are because you can't be a faithful, unconditional friend just like Jonathan does. Here's the thing. Their friendship was marked by something much deeper than shared interest. It was marked by something deeper than just like shared hatred. We hate the Philistines. We both like killing them. Let's go kill them together. Let's be friends. Their friendship was marked by covenant. They were saying, God, kill me if I'm not faithful to this friendship, to this relationship. But here's the thing. It won't last. Jonathan eventually dies. And I think if you look at the life of David, David's never the same again. And I think, it's conjecture, but I think had Jonathan not died, the story that we'll get to in 2 Samuel between David and Bathsheba, I don't think that event unfolds like it does if Jonathan stays alive. Because Jonathan's the one who would have stepped in and said, David, let me remind you of who God is and whose you are and whose Bathsheba is. Don't do this, David. This is not the way of God. The relationship doesn't last. Jonathan eventually dies. And here's the thing, like, a text like this leaves us longing for this kind of relationship. Like, David's so lucky. I wish I had a Jonathan like this. It leaves us longing for something that, if we're honest, is never quite satisfied in our lives the way that we want it to be. About a thousand years after this moment, as Jesus is discipling his followers, there's a moment before Jesus goes to the cross where he's talking with his followers who he loves a lot. And these were all guys who have said, Jesus, we're with you. We're going to follow you. You're our rabbi. Teach us the way to live. He says to them in John 15, verse 15, I do not call you servants anymore because a servant doesn't know what his master is doing. I have called you friends 
because I've made known to you everything I've heard from my Father. So Jesus does something that no rabbi would have done during this time. No rabbi would have referred to his servants, the men who were following him, as friends. And Jesus says, hey, no longer do I call you servants. I call you friends. And what we see in Jesus is that Jesus is not just king, but he's also friend to his people. Jesus is the friend that sticks closer than a brother. Proverbs 18, 24 is fulfilled in Jesus, which says, there's a friend who stays closer than a brother. And what you see in Jesus is that kind of friendship. Jesus is the friend who lays down his life for you. John 15, verse 13, a couple verses before that, he says, there's no greater love than to lay down one's life for one's friends. And Jesus lays down his life for his friends Just after his friends had betrayed Jesus and denied that they even knew him, Jesus still does that because that's the the kind of friend that Jesus is. Jesus is the friend whose loyalty to you costs him something personally. 2 Corinthians 8, 9, Paul tells us, you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor so that by his poverty you might become rich. Do you see how Jesus is the true Jonathan? Jonathan. Jonathan, though he was rich, lays down his riches so that David, though poor, could become rich. And this is what Jesus does. Jesus lays down his riches so that you, though poor, could receive the blessings that only Jesus deserves because that's the kind of friend he is. Jesus is the friend who can always be found and will never let you down. Matthew 28, he tells his friends, his followers, Before he goes back to the right hand of God the Father, he says, remember, I am with you always. When he promises him that he's going to send the Holy Spirit, he tells him, I'm not going to leave you as orphans. I'm going to send the Spirit to you. He's a friend who can always be found, and he'll never let you down. Hebrews 13, verse 5 and 6 says, he himself has said, I will never leave you or abandon you. Therefore, we may boldly say, The Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. What can man do to me? In 2019, I ended up in Oklahoma City. Um, A good friend of mine had asked me to stop there on our way. We were driving to this cabin in California that my family owned, and I was like, I'm done with friendship. I think the Lord's done with me. I, I, I give up, man. It's too much. The cost is too great. And a good friend said, hey, why don't you stop here on the way through? And um, that led to us being in Oklahoma City for a while. And um, Charlie Hall, who's become a dear, dear friend to me, pulled me aside and he said, I think I got an impression from the Lord for you that I want to share with you. And um, he said, I think in this season, Jesus wants you to know that he's not just your king, he's your friend. And he wants you to discover for the first time what it means that he's your friend. And that year for us, 2019, going into 2020, like that's what happened. I I had realized that my whole life, my concept of Jesus is he's God, he's king, he's worthy of my praises. And I think I thought he was other people's friends, but I just felt like, (laughs) why would you want to be my friend? Like I'm not a great friend, you know? And um, what I discovered during that time is what I would offer to you, and that's that until you deepen and find satisfaction in friendship with Jesus, you're never going to be satisfied with friendships this side of glory. And hey, don't hear what I'm not saying. I'm not saying, like, Jesus is the only friend you need. Screw them all. Who needs them? Because here's the thing. If you don't find satisfaction in your friendship with Jesus, you'll end up going into the ditch with friendships one of two ways. And one way is, People let you down, you can't trust them, you can only trust Jesus, and you'll end up a bristly person who doesn't ever let people in too close because they might hurt you. Or you'll end up the type of person, if you don't find satisfaction in your friendship with Jesus, you'll end up the type of person who, like, if the first person is, I don't need anyone, this side is, I need everyone. I I can't, nobody can let me down. I need people to be there for me all the time, and my whole world is shaken when a friend doesn't add up to what I need them to be. That kind of person overwhelms friendships in their lives. If the first kind of person becomes like a, 
hey, you won't let me in. How am I supposed to be your friend? The second kind of person is like, I'm overwhelmed by your expectations of me because I can't be perfect for you. Like that person ends up, I don't know if you've seen Tommy Boy. Tommy Boy is in that moment in the diner where he's talking about the sale. He can never make a sale. He always messes it up. He's got the role and he's like, my friend, you know, my friend is like this role and I love it and I pet it and it's so precious, you're so adorable. And then I, and then I kill it and I squish it. And what do I do, you know? Or maybe if you're like, I don't like Tommy Boy, I like Looney Tunes. Looney Tunes, it's, it's that, that big animal, I don't know what it is, who's like, I shall call him George, and I will love him, and I will pet him, and I will squeeze him. That's what we can do with friendships if we're not finding our satisfaction in Jesus. What friendship with Jesus does is it puts pressure on the right shoulders. And lest you think that the invitation is like, hey, you don't need friendships at the end of the day. You just need Jesus. Satisfaction and friendship with Jesus leads to way deeper friendships than you could ever imagine otherwise. My wife, I didn't think I was going to do this in the 11. She was here at the 9, so I expected it. But she is the best friend I have ever had in my life. And our marriage has not always been that way, man. Um, our mar- in fact, Our friendship was born out of a moment where I told her, I feel broken because I'm realizing in our relationship, I love you, I would lay down my life for you, but I don't like you. And um, I'm not kidding, man, no joke. Picture being a wife and hearing that. And she said, "Um, has it taken you this long to realize that? And we just wept before the Lord together. And I was like, I just want to be your friend again. I want to remember that we're not just in this business relationship where we agree to make babies and and send kids into the world and run a home together. God's actually called us to be friends. And here's what we both realized during that season. Our friendship had waned and failed because both of us expected the other to be Jesus for us. And we can do this in our marriages and in our friendships. What that means is, If Kristen is meant to be Jesus for me, I cannot handle her failing me because that means my only friend has failed. And on the flip side, if she expects me to be Jesus for her, I have to live a life of pretending or performing. I have to hide in such a way that I can't ever let her know that I've let her down because I know that it's going to crush her. But here's the thing. When we were finally able to look up and to, we literally went through this practice together where I said, I am freeing you from the weight that only Jesus can carry. I want you to be my bride and my friend, but Jesus is my savior. And she told me, I'm freeing you from the weight that only Jesus can carry for me. I need you to be my friend and my husband. I don't need you to be my savior. What Jesus formed and developed around that was this beautiful friendship. And the same happens in marriages and with friendships. Because here's the thing. If you're expecting your friend to be what only Jesus can be, and here's what I mean when I say that. Only Jesus will always be there for you at all times. Only Jesus will never let you down. Your spouse can't be that. Your friends can't be that. But if you're expecting your friends to be that, you're setting up a moment where either you feel... um, Like, you cannot be your true self around them. Because here's the thing. What if you become your true self around them and they reject who you are? So it's like, I got to live with this mask of who I think you need me to be so that you will stay with me as a friend. Or you end up on this other side like, dude, you can't trust anybody. And I don't need friends. I only need Jesus. Well, not even Jesus does that. Jesus doesn't say, guys, you're my servants. I don't need friends. I'm my own best friend. He says, hey, I've called you friends. He invites us to experience that kind of friendship. And here's what that frees us to do. This is what makes it so incredible. This is why it's amazing for me. I was texting a group of friends this morning and saying, what God has done through them is redeemed and restored friendship. And the friendship I experience with them is deeper than the friendship I thought I had. And it's, it's not because those people were terrible and they weren't really friends and all that. It's just the pressure is on the right shoulders now. And so what we're able to say together as friends is, hey, I don't need you to be Jesus for me. And I don't need to be Jesus for you. Or like, I can't be Jesus for you. And what that means is like, let's roll together. 
Let's look to Jesus together. When Jesus is the foundation of a friendship and friendship in marriage, that friendship can endure all kinds of things. Because at the, 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 the foundation solid. If the foundation of your friendship is just that other friend, the minute you guys experience conflict, it crumbles. But if the foundation of a friendship is friendship with Jesus, that friendship can start to endure times where you're not talking to each other, times where you feel distant, times where you feel like, man, you've really hurt me as a friend. That kind of foundation in Christ enables you to go to another friend and say the thing that you're worried might ruin the friendship. And that's that like, hey, I really miss our friendship. Or like, you really let me down in this moment and I want to work through it with you. It brings so much freedom to relationships. It also enables you to be grateful when you have deep friendships rather than to live in such a way that you're just terrified of losing them all the time. Because do we not do this? We do the like, I don't know if you're anything like me, but like in my flesh, I'm prone to live like the other shoe is going to drop all the time. So I can't ever enjoy a friendship in my flesh because I'm like, well, it might be gone tomorrow. If you're living with the fear of something being taken, all that, it doesn't make it any better. I think what we think is if we protect ourselves, like it won't hurt as bad. It doesn't work. Hurts just as bad. And the bummer of a thing is that you weren't able to enjoy any of the good times. I can look back on 2019 and not do the self-protective thing where I'm like, dude, they were never friends anyway, and they were just snakes, and I, I, I missed it, and what in the world's wrong with me? I can look back on that and with honesty say, that was wrong, that's not how Jesus responds to people, and I can also say, man, I'm really grateful that I had that kind of friendship for the time I had it. Like, it wasn't a fake friendship. We just got to the point where there was a foundation. We were just expecting each other to be Jesus. Hey, and by the way, they're not the only ones who failed in friendship. I did too. I make a really terrible Jesus, and I have a tendency to expect other people to be a really good Jesus for me. It enables you to be grateful when you have those kind of friendships and to look with fondness on friendships that maybe used to be deep and that aren't anymore. It enables you to pursue vulnerability and authenticity can't be vulnerable with someone that like, if, if, if the fear is I'm going to lose this relationship, be that your spouse or a friend, you realize you cannot be vulnerable. You can't be your true self because there's this fear. I don't want to lose this relationship. I might lose it if I'm honest about who I really am. Therefore, I will just put on a mask of who I think they want me to be as a friend. And we project to them the type of person we think they want us to be. Dude, that's no way to live. Jesus frees us from all of that. And Jesus frees us to say, even if people don't accept the true me, Jesus does. And Jesus enables me to find and form deep relationships across those things. He frees friendship to be much deeper than it ever could have been without him. He frees friendships to be marked by those who believe the best about one another. What you can do when Jesus is the foundation of a friendship is you can actually Not treat a friend like an enemy where you assign motives. I'm hurt, therefore you must have desired to hurt me. When Jesus is the foundation, you can go to a friend and you can say, hey, I'm going to believe the best, man. Help me understand the way that I experienced that. Here's how I experienced that. Is that right? There's so much freedom when Jesus is the foundation of relationships like that. When you make the covenant to say, hey, let's be faithful to one another. And in moments where we're not, let's be grateful that Jesus is. Jesus is God, he's king, but he's also your friend. And his invitation to you today is maybe to discover for the first time or to rediscover friendship with him. And if you don't don't yet follow Jesus, the question is, do you want a friend? Let's pray together. Jesus, um, I know there's corners of our hearts, there's corners of my heart where when good news like this is held out for us, that there is a friend who sticks closer than a brother, that there's a friend, you, Jesus, who've laid down your life for us at great cost to yourself, that we might be made one with God, be restored to God, like that you'll never leave us or forsake us. There's something in us that says it's too good to be true. It's not for me, it's for other people. So Jesus, I pray in some way that you would go for that area of our hearts that part that even in this moment is saying, 
It's too good to be true. Speak to the dark corners and rooms of our hearts, Lord. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Hey, friends, let's stand together. And I want to